Thank you for listening to the Plain State Podcast, a production of the Department of English at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. In 2019, UNL's slam poetry team had their most successful year in competition since their founding in 2015, placing in the top 20 in the nation. In this episode, four members of that team, Bianca Swift, Celie Knutson, Celine Haynes, and Jack Buchanan, sit down to discuss their writing process, how they perform their work, and how that work is influenced by personal experiences and cultural events. The UNL Slam Poetry Team is coached by Stacy Waite, who you will hear referenced in this episode. Hey, my name is Celie. Uh, I'm a senior at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'm an English major um, and a women's and gender studies major. And I've been doing slam since I was a senior in high school, but I've been writing poetry for a lot longer before that. Okay. My name is Celine Haynes, and I'm a senior. Um, I'm double majoring in broadcast production and advertising and public relations. And I have been on the SLAM team for two years now, and I have been writing poetry for so long. But I think I really started my junior year of high school with LTAP, so Louder Than a Bomb Poetry, which was pretty dope. So, yeah, I love poetry. It's awesome. Um, my name is Bianca Swift. I'm a junior in college right now. I'm an English major with a French and African American studies minor. I have been doing slam since freshman year of high school, I think. Um, and I've been writing poetry, I think, since before I could even remember. So. My name is Jack Ken. I'm a sophomore broadcast production major with the School of Journalism. I am, have been doing slam poetry since my freshman year of high school and been writing poems since before then. A good place to start would be as uh, we received the suggestion to yeah. talk about our writing processes. Um, um, I like talking about creativity in general, just like how artists come up with the things they come up with and how you need downtime mm-hmm. and you can't just be constantly grinding out work. Yeah. So I guess I could start talking about my process, which it. I'm sure is similar to a lot of you guys when I don't really have like a set thing that I do. Um, the one thing that I find helps me a lot when I'm writing is to just kind of read it out loud. I just read, and then the next line that pops to my head, I write down. Mm-hmm. And then I start from the top, and I read, and then the next line that pops to my head, I write down. But it's yeah. not like an actual, I don't have a rubric, I don't have yeah. like an outline. Uh, it just kind of appears. I don't know if my experience is similar to you guys. Yeah, maybe. not like a process per se, but like kind of just like... Like a kind of like a stream of consciousness kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a thing that happens that a poem sometimes comes to you. So I've had like two experiences. You either like have a poem come to you immediately, Mm -hmm. you write it down and it probably needs revision, it probably needs work, but the poem happened. And that I think is really hard to harness and replicate. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's super interesting about the team is that... So we slam, we have slams in the fall, um, and we compete, and they're pretty casual, and then we have a grand slam that decides who's on the team, and then once you're on the team, we spend basically all of spring semester until April putting together work, and I think what happens is that's when the whole, like, a poem just coming to you kind of flies out the window, mm-hmm. that's when it becomes this sort of really, there's a lot of hard work involved, I mean, to me, my writing process is like deadlines, mm-hmm. I would never have a poem done if I didn't have a coach or teammates or someone or myself even sometimes I guess setting a deadline for me saying a poem needs to be on the page now it doesn't have to be good but it has to be on the page and then we can go from there I think another thing that's really interesting about our process as slam poets is that we write together a lot yeah that's true. which is probably different than I think I think everyone thinks of writing as a sort of solitary act and I think that's my favorite part about the team is that's not what it is at all I mean I can't tell you how many hours Bianca and I have spent in a library putting together work that's been like my most fulfilling part of the team, I think, mm-hmm. is not only getting to create art that I'm proud of, but having individuals on the team that I really love and respect as people and as artists that I get to sit together in a room with frequently and like make new beautiful things, often about things that are like painful to us or um, things that are hard for us to work through. I don't know. I think it's like one of the coolest things I'm a part of at the university. Yeah, really. Yeah, like, for me, when it comes to writing a poem, it's the most messiest thing that, I don't know, that I can ever do because it's really hard for me to come up with ideas sometimes. It's either based off of an experience I had, like, if I went through a really traumatic thing or if 
some crazy lady at a store just came up to me and I'm like, oh, I got to write a poem about it. It's hard for me to figure out exactly where, where I want to go with poems, especially, I know this is kind of political, but especially as a black woman, like I feel like sometimes I have a box of poems that mm-hmm. I have to produce and then like anything outside of that box is going to be a no from an audience. So it gets hard for me to figure out where I can go with my art sometimes. But when I do come up with ideas, um, just like y'all, like I, I don't, I don't have a framework for how I'm going to do it each time. It's always messy, and um, I'm the type of person where like I get all my ideas in the shower. So <laughs> I'm like, um, I'll like hear something, and then I get in the shower, and I'm just repeating it over and over and over. But then when I get out of the shower, I forget it. So half times when it's done to poems, I never remember what I thought of in the first place. <laughs> so that's annoying, but. Yeah, for me, it's just kind of random. And then at the end of the day, it comes together and it forms into something. I don't know if it's good, but it's something. It's always good. That's Celine. It's, it's, it's always good. Yeah, that is, it's always good with Celine, but it always is like, it's like something, right? Yeah, and something. like that's as much as you can do. Yeah, my poetry process is kind of weird. So I, I used to, when I was like maybe more creative or just dumber, like, like be able to like, sit down and like have a flash poem like come across my head and like write the whole thing in one sitting. But now um the process is more like I always it's always like just ideas. Or like I usually always have like one line and I'm like this is a good line. What can I write around it to highlight that line? And so yeah my poetry process it's usually like me like driving and then like trying to like speak into the Google notes. So I don't like crash, um, <laughs> and then like waiting a year and then coming back to it and then like writing a poem. <laughs> That's yeah. essentially the poetry process for me. Yeah. I was coming up with my best ideas while driving. Yeah. It's very dangerous. <laughs> it's so dangerous. You gotta, you, it's gotta come from somewhere. Else. <laughs> I literally I ran into a turtle one time, but like not like no, so, no like so lightly. I was so because I was like I like saw it and I like swerve. I was swerving, but I was also like recording a poem. But he's fine. You ran into a no, turtle. No, so gentle. Oh, she's <laughs> deadly, y'all. It's deadly. So he was, like, barely attacked, because I was already stopping. Like, I was ready to stop. And so, he's fine. He's fine. I was, you said a turtle? Yes. I was in, I was in Houston. I was in okay. Texas. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I kind of gathered from what, all you, well, from what you all said is that, that I would agree with, is that we don't really start, like, People ask me all the time, like, how do you do that? <laughs> I don't know. But we don't really start with, like, the lines kind of, they kind of come from a small thing, an mm-hmm. idea, a line. For me, it's, like, a stanza here or there. Like, okay. I know that this one is going to eventually be at the end, but right now it needs to be at the beginning because that's just how my brain works. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a very organic process. And, like, Celia was talking about, collaboration is also a huge part of it. Right. There are things that I never would have even thought of. Just having somebody else's perspective is so beneficial. I also agree because there's something about um, because I think poetry writing, like especially page poetry writing, like it is such like I, it's such a lonely process. Mm-hmm. When I was like writing over the summer for like a thing that I had to do, like it was like um, I was just in my room like twenty four seven, and I was like, wow, I'm so sad. And the poems were good. But I was like, still so sad. And the it's like so amazing. Like I also remember like some of our best moments, I think, is just like me and like Steely, like in a room, or like us like all like sitting around like a table and sitting around like a table and just like truly enjoying each other's company and like sometimes never getting anything done and then also sometimes writing whole poems. I think that's just like that's like the most amazing thing. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Robert just put on the board that we're supposed to trash talk Stacey Wade now, which kind of tangentially leads to my next point. Um, <laughs> um, I think that what's really interesting um, is that I firmly believe that anyone can write poems. Um, and I think that at least three of us, uh, Selena, Bianca, and I currently work for the Nebraska Writers Collective as teaching artists, teaching poems to high school kids. Yes. And Jack... Um, Jack, Jack is interning this year. So we all kind of are involved in this like youth poetry scene or have been since we were in high school. Um, and I think that's a huge part is like this idea that there are poets who come for you um, and poets who kind of teach you what this is, what what's possible on the stage. I think a huge moment for me was the first time I saw um, Stacy perform. I was actually closeted and uh, didn't even really know I was gay. Um, and Stacy performed, and I saw this, like, living, 
queer person who was also a poet. And, like, up until that point, I had no idea that you could be alive and a poet or alive and gay. Like, <laughs> like I had I come from a rural background, so I just, like, didn't know. Um, and I think that that's really, really powerful is kind of the legacy of SLAM. Um, mm-hmm. I think that Bianca and Celine can probably talk to that a lot as well. And Jack, I guess I just know I've had that conversation oh, yeah, with no. them. I have people who have been, like, super influential. When I first got to Lincoln High, like... Slam was huge there, right? We had this dude, his name's Charlie Curtis Beard, he makes mm. music in Chicago. Look at him. He's a look great up, musician. that's our actual recommendation for this podcast is look up Charlie Curtis Beard. <laughs> He's great. But um he was like the guy, right? And his he graduated the year that I mean the year after, year before, I got to the I got to Lincoln High. So when I got there, Slam was huge and there was another poet by the name of Tiana Lewis mm. who was like very very mentor mentee sort of relationship that we had because she saw that I wanted that I had things to say and just didn't really know how to say them and when you see somebody do it it gives you confidence and it gives you like a starting place it was yeah and then also like speaking to like the mentor mentee kind of thing there is um there's something so amazing about like this like poetry slam community because I think that was one of the first things I noticed when I was doing it in high school right like in high school like it wasn't like now like I was much I was much lamer and like <laughs> you're still lame now but like imagine like me but like much lamer um and then uh, like I feel like all the other clubs I was in they told me that they'd be communities but they weren't mm-hmm. but slam poetry like El Tabit like always was and like not to cry but <laughs> it was like it was so like I it, like, saved me in, like, a really weird way. Not that I was, like, not, like, okay, but I was, like, it, like, saved me in a really weird way where I was, like, this is where I feel safe. This is where I feel wanted. This is where I feel heard. Mm-hmm. And I feel, like, often black women don't get heard. Awesome. And <laughs> it was crazy to be, like, a black woman and, like, speak and then people listened. Like, they actually listened. That was really cool. Yeah, like, I definitely, like, from my standpoint, as also a black woman, like, um, when I was starting off with poetry back in high school, like what the community really did for me was show show to me that there was still humans out there <laughs> who had a heart and who actually cared about you and everything didn't have to be black and white. Um, and when it was, people were there to hear your side. And, um, I really enjoyed that, especially when I was young because I was going through so much and I didn't know who to talk to or how to talk about it. So. Um, poetry was that outlet for me to really get my thoughts out there and to know that somebody in the audience connects with me. And even if they don't, like, I could feel the love through the scores and the snaps. And so that was really awesome for me. And then coming to college and doing it just reiterated, like, the same things, but on a whole new level because you're an adult now. So actually finding your identity and sharing that with the world is, like, huge. And it actually means something. So... Um, doing like Cupsy here, it it really has taught me to love myself more and to love the environment. And when we went to like um, when we went to our first, well, when I went to my first Cupsy competition, it was mind blowing. Like <laughs> there was so many people that just didn't care about what other people thought of them, and I had never experienced that. And I've been in Nebraska my whole life, you know. So like. Going somewhere where people are wearing what they want, saying what they want, just being, I don't know, just, I don't know how to even explain it. Just imagine just a world where no one really cares and they respect each other. That's how it is at Cupsy. To add poetry to that, to hear everyone's story along with that freedom of being yourself was mind-blowing. And I honestly wish everyone could could experience it. But really, that's the impact that this can do for people and Mm -hmm. has done for me. Yeah, I think maybe also to just back up a little bit about Cupsy. So Cupsy is the national poetry slam put on for university teams around the globe. So every year we go and compete. We have a UNL team that we set up and we compete against teams from all over the continent. And also I think we've had like the UK and India there. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. it's super cool. Um, but I do think that that's something really interesting to point out. We've like been to going around identity and diversity a lot. And just like at this table, you have four people who have identities that aren't recognize as much in Nebraska it feels like um and I think that that's super interesting like the idea that we can provide a 
a space for these identities and also for four Nebraskan kids. Like, I think when people think of Nebraska, they think of straight white rural people. Right. Um, and it's been so marvelous to me to like have this community of kids and adults who don't occupy those identities, who occupy identities that are othered, who are bringing just as much fire as some of these teams that are, you know, from places like New York City and, you know, stuff like that. I don't know. I just think that's been really valuable as well. So I think we've talked about, like, how much we care about each other as people and artists and how much we respect each other. Um, we kind of wanted to talk about what we personally think are our best and worst poems and maybe a little bit about um, what the team thinks of other people's artistry. I think that's really interesting. So, Bianca, do you have, like, a favorite or, like, a least favorite poem that you've ever written? I... It's really kind of complicated because I have poems that I wrote when I was, like, a child that I don't like now, but I'm also like, is that fair? The child song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the most recent poem I've written that I don't really like is um, the one that I just really don't, it's a poem about um, protest and it's like a really complicated thing for me to grasp because I keep thinking about um, events like Trayvon Martin at events mm -hmm. where, events where um, black people we hold on to a name and a body that doesn't necessarily belong to us. Mm. But at the same time, of course it does, because they all belong to us. But I just know that how like horrid is it to like share your son or your brother with like the rest of the world. You know what I mean? Because like because I just keep thinking that how how terrible was it that I was almost gonna say when if my little brother were to die, mm. I know that I'd be just so infuriated if someone said his name like they like they like they knew him you know what I mean and that's like it's just really hard for me to write because on one hand I'm of course with the protesters because we have to speak out like we are like suffering we're dying but on the other hand I'm just like but how hard must it be and it's just like a really really hard poem for me to write and it's super messy um and so I'm like trying really hard, but it's just, it's just not quite there yet, and I can just tell. Um, so yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's hard to force those kind of things because you definitely. I've been in similar situations where you want to say something, but just for whatever reason, your mind can't figure it out. It happened to me this year, actually, in my freshman year. I wrote this poem, and it was about a friend of mine who had gone to jail for a little while, and I felt really bad about it, but. I wrote something that, I don't remember the exact line. No, yeah, I do, I lied. Uh, <laughs> the line was, uh, us black boys who kill each other had it coming, right? And I really liked that line because I wanted it to be, I wanted people to recognize that, hey, I can have thoughts of, uh, I could have inappropriate thoughts about mm -hmm. people of my own race, even though I'm so adamantly against the way that black people are treated or the kinds of things that they have to go through. But uh, this is Celine actually that said something to me when we were in, while we were like, workshopping that poem yeah. in practice, she was like, you got to figure out a better way to say this or cause no one's, cause I know what you mean. Well, I, I don't know what you mean. Um, it's just like, like when you, when you first said that line to me, it caught me off guard because like in my experience, um, I have actually seen like, my cousin gets shot and killed by the police. Like, I've seen these things and I've lived them. And they've been so close to me personally that, like, when you said that line, I know, I kind of knew where you were going with it, but also I knew that a piece of me did not like it. And it hit me in a way where I was like, no, we're not going to do this. Like, I'm a black woman. I'm not going to let you go on stage and say that because it felt like you were saying, like, black black boys deserve it, you know? Mm. And um, I know that's not what you're saying now that we workshopped it and things, but, like, when I first heard that, I was just confused because um, kind of like both you and Bianca are saying, like, identity. Like, mm. the identity part of it is wild because you feel attached to something because you are of that identity, but you feel um, not attached to it for some reason. So for you personally, um, I understand, like, you are biracial. So, like, I understood that part of you doesn't get it in the full extent that maybe somebody like me would, and you needed to come to terms with that. So, like, at first, I was like, I don't know what to say about it. No, but yeah. At, I don't know. I think that 
first when you finish the poem like you knew exactly where you wanted to go with mm-hmm. it but that's just it caught me off guard in the beginning that yeah your perspective was invaluable like it wouldn't be where i wanted it to be it would not have had the weight or said what i actually wanted to say if i didn't show it to you and you said something about it and that's something that i thought was one of the most like interesting experiences and i also think those are like those are always like the worst like the hardest things to write because it's like I think we also have to like acknowledge that within the black community, as much as like we want to be like black power, there's like so much like in embedded hatred. Mm-hmm. Like things like you don't even want to admit. And those are things you should write poems about. And so that's like but when you try, they're like the most difficult ones. They are. Like if I were to try to write a poem about being privileged as a lighter skinned black person, mm-hmm. there's going to be flaws in that. Mm-hmm. Like organically there's flaws in that. So it becomes hard to even dissect those type of conversations and to speak in similar terms with that, like, I've had times where I wanted to talk about my body, like, outside of being a black woman, but just my body and the way that it's shaped. But I feel like I can't talk about my body as the shape that it is because I'm not I'm not as big as somebody else or as small as somebody else. And it, it hurts me because I really want to talk about those things. So when I hear poems, like, from Bianca and Seeley, when they talk about, like, their bodies and how it consumes them, it like sometimes it frustrates me and my identity because the way I view my body mm-hmm. I view it similar to that but I don't know how to say that in a way where it sounds comfortable I don't know if that's off topic but it made me think of that yeah I think this is something this team does so much <laughs> which is my favorite thing actually is that we're constantly wrestling with these identities that are put against each other and pinned against each other I'm thinking about on the way home we went to Houston last year and on the way home, on the drive, we got into this really intense argument about what poverty means and the different experiences of the people in the car and just how vast and varied our experiences with money had been. And I know there have been times that all of us have walked out of practice and been super frustrated with someone in the room. I know there are times when I feel like I've been hurt by something that Celine said about her body as someone who occupies like a privileged skinny body and times that I've messed up as a white person as I'm listening to all these Black people navigate race in their poems. And I think that that is like, the, to me, while it's super hard, it's the coolest thing we do. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, how do I as a fat woman and, and Celine as a black woman honor each other in the ways we're privileged over each other and the ways we're not? And how do we do it in words? Like, that's impossible, but it's so cool. Um, what was it? Was it two years ago now? One year ago, maybe, that Bianca and I wrote this poem about <laughs> who's a white supremacist who actually still attends her campus. Um, it's horrible, but like, obviously we're, it's horrible. But um, we wrote this poem about this man who goes to UNL, um, who has been photographed in the act of like hitting someone at the Charlottesville rally. Not um, hitting them, almost hitting them. Almost hitting them, we don't, sorry. Sorry, you know, <laughs> you decided that we don't have enough evidence. Um, but Bianca and I wrote this poem about it. Um, I as a white woman, Bianca as a black woman, we wrote this duet. And in that duet, what we're doing is something that I don't think a lot of poets are really trying to do yet, which is like, how can a white person be on stage and talk about race? Um, how can they offer up their body as um, some sort of, some sort of, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is. How can, how can you let yourself be implicated? So what we did in the poem was super cool. Bianca and I wrote this poem about this white supremacist, and we talked about the ways in which I was scared, and the ways in which Bianca was scared, and which, and the ways in which I am a part of everything that makes who he is and it was like this really powerful thing where two identities were up there talking in a way that I just don't think we see a lot of those conversations mm-hmm. certainly we don't see them in Nebraska um but it's, it's my favorite thing we do I agree and I think like the line that like captured like if can you remember it was like um you said something about being scared I can never remember being this scared something along the lines of that right yeah um and then I said you will never be this scared yeah and that was um, I think I said something about how I didn't, I never known what it felt like to be prey before. And I said, you still don't, don't know, know what it feels like, like to be prey. Yeah. just know what it's like to be scared. Mm-hmm. And there was this, this really, like, I remember us writing that poem and me having this moment where I was just like, I feel like it's not fair for me to get to be in this room with these people who I just admire so much. I feel like I learn every day I walk into the room. Um, I also understand the ways my body automatically takes up space on the team, especially in a place like Nebraska. Um, and just how, how, what can happen, the magic that can happen if you really sit down, mm-hmm. not that like BS, like sit down with your oppressor and like <laughs> give yourself to your oppressor, but the magic that can happen when you sit down with people who care about each other 
who want to talk about what, the ways it's actually working versus kind of the narratives that we're fed. Mm-hmm. And um, we're also willing to grow from it. Mm-hmm. And people who are, we just also differently privileged and oppressed. Like mm-hmm. every person on this team has a privilege over someone else on the team. And every person is also oppressed in ways against other people on the team. Like, it's just really interesting. I've never been a part of a group like this. And I've never like been lucky enough to kind of get to talk about it. Yeah. I anyway, Jack, what is your worst poem? <laughs> oh, <laughs> the great right transition, Bianca. <laughs> that was, I like, I like my worst poem. I like it in yeah. a way that it was great. Cause it was, it was the first poem that I also wrote. Mm-hmm. Like legitimately. So cute. That went on stage. And I had no idea what to write about. I was scared to be super vulnerable and open on stage. So I was like, I'm going to write about something that no one is going to be able to handle me for. So I wrote about my favorite rap group of all time. So we take time. <laughs> and I started the poem out. That screamed at the top of my lungs. Wu-Tang forever. And I just kept, uh, I went on with it. It's great. And people like text me, Wu-Tang forever. Just people from high school. Randomly and it's funny. I like it. That's amazing. I think live. Oh, go ahead. I was just saying, I'm going to start texting you. That's all I can do. <laughs> I think my worst poem is similar in that um, I actually think my worst poem is one that I performed tonight. It's a poem about being queer and being happy. Don't, oh no, gosh, let me get to it. That. So I think that this poem is like, it's about how you can be queer and depressed and like your queerness is not your depression all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, I just from like an artistic standpoint, I don't think it's my best work, but I think that it offers something else, which is something I think Jack is kind of talking about, and that a lot of what people think slam poetry is, and also a lot of what slam poetry is becoming, is someone going onto a stage, sharing their trauma, receiving a number for how bad that trauma is, and how well they talked about it, and how well they wrote about it, and then walking off the stage. That That's what it's becoming, um, and that is scary to me. I think that slam is like the coolest arena for work that kind of work of how do we unpack trauma how do we continue to live in a world that i really honestly believe that wants every single one of us this table dead in some way or another um so how do we how do we walk through the world like that that's great i love that about slam i also don't want it to be this thing that you go up and you talk about how bad your story is and you hope it's worse than everyone else in the room and you hope you win because of that um, so while I think that my, like, I'm queer, I'm depressed, but that's not the same, and I can be happy, and queerness is a source of joy in my life, while that poem maybe isn't my favorite thing I've ever written artistically, I think it holds a really interesting space, um, and I think it's really important, and sometimes, you know, um, sometimes you just want to go up in the middle of the slam and talk about how good it is, like, mm-hmm. I think that there's, like, a lot to be said about celebration and joy in slam, mm-hmm. I think that people are doing more of that every day as we kind of fight this battle of, like, just putting ourselves up there. Mm-hmm has bodies to be judged <laughs> um but yeah i think that's probably my worst poem and in some ways also my favorite because of it and yeah. i do want to point out that it's still an amazing poem it really <laughs> is it's like very good and like don't let her fool you because it's like very <laughs> we all love each other way too much any of us could put absolute garbage on the stage and we'd be like that's the that's best not- thing <laughs> i've ever heard well, that's oh, not true gosh. because no one's ever put absolute garbage on the stage that's true <laughs> we're all we're doing pretty good we're like we're pretty good i mean i hate to say it but i think we're pretty good <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, i um, would agree <laughs> To speak on that point a little bit, one of the things that I've always kind of disliked about Slam yeah. is, like you said, it turns into a, oh, I hope my story is worse than yours so that I get more points. Mm-hmm. And the points have always been the problem, but it also seems like the points are the only way that people want to come and compete. Like, the com- <laughs> the competition is a part of it. Like, people want to do well and want to win, but I don't know. It's we such... Like, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's such like a... A struggle because internally you're like, I hate that I'm, I feel like I'm doing, uh, I mean, I'm presenting a negative thing just so that it can be more traumatic or more negative yeah. than someone else's so that we can win. And it just, yeah. it doesn't feel good. And it's not like we're all trying to do that, mm-hmm. but gosh. And I, I feel like for me personally, I've matured in that way mm-hmm. because when I first started doing poetry, especially back in Louder Than Bomb times when I was in high school, like I felt like I had to write to a certain standard mm-hmm. and I had to present to a certain standard. And mm-hmm. if I wasn't on that bracket, for instance, to be specific, like if I wasn't talking about like my poverty part of being a black person, if I wasn't talking about that, then everything I do is trash from that point forward mm-hmm. or no one's going to care about it. Like I used to feel that way all the time. And I remember, I'm not trying to put Stacey on, on blast, on blast <laughs> but I remember 
Um, not so long ago, um, we were talking, I think it might have been last year. I think it's the same team, maybe. But I wanted to write a poem that was that was funny. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to write it in a way that it had nothing to do with the color of my skin. But um, just me as a person. And I struggled so much. So when I was at home trying to write it, because I kept telling myself, this is not good enough. There's nothing about this that someone's going to connect to. Mm-hmm. And like it took me a while to realize that who cares if they connect to it because mm-hmm. it's my poem. Mm-hmm. I own this piece. I wrote it, so it's mine to claim. And I remember I was telling Stacy about it, and part of Stacy's reaction was like, yeah, that's cool, but I need you to do this. And um, it took me a minute to kind of like, I don't know, I just kept holding on to that reaction that, um, coach gave me at first like I don't know if that's going to work because we want to win and stuff like that so it took me a while to go home and figure out how I was going to present this poem and at first it was my I hated it, it was, it's the poem about my diabetes yep. so I wrote a poem about being a type 1 diabetic and it's called Rose Battle with my diabetes <laughs> Something like that. but um, I just remember like I hated it at first because I didn't know where I wanted to go with it, how it was going to be taken by the audience, if people would even care about diabetes because everyone thinks diabetics are only big people who just suck at living. Like, no one thinks about diabetics in different ways and manners and shapes. So, like, it, it, um, I didn't know where I wanted to go with it. But once I was able to really present it to my team and everything and people understood that diabetes Anybody can be a diabetic in any skin, in any shape, any health, and that it can still resonate with people no matter what. Um, that's when I just realized that my worst poem was also one of my favorites. Special thanks to Jack Buchanan, Celine Haynes, Celie Knudsen, and Bianca Swift. Plain State is produced by Robert Lipscomb. Post-production by Stephen Ramsey. Music by Shadows on a River. My name is Jack Melody. On behalf of the Department of English at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, thank you for listening to the Plain State Podcast. Tagline forthcoming.